Um, this is a journey that started with a commission where Abacus uh, was reviewed the proposals of a local development. The results of the initial investigation developed into a dissertation as a technical report for my application for Chartered Engineer. And it's now transformed into this uh, presentation. And I'm very grateful of the support of Dave Cooper and the watchful mentoring of Dr. Gina Barney. And if it weren't for their efforts and encouragement, I may be still staring at an early draft and we may be looking at a blank screen. <coughs> it was a challenging journey and the process raised some interesting points and questions. Unfortunately, we can't go to them all today, but you're welcome to read the paper or the technical report. Whoops, sorry. The investigation originates from an ongoing project. It was an architect's vision for a brownfield site in Nottingham city centre. My technical report developed the initial assessment and the analysis Abacus provided in 2016. It focuses on the different methods of assessment and the simulated performances of the group control systems considered. It was surprising to note that the newest and the most sophisticated system failed to satisfy all the requirements of the client and the BCO. This raised a few eyebrows around the design team. We all expected the new technology to provide answers to all the questions this development uh, presented. So the investigation set out to examine why the control systems performed so differently and although this is about traffic and control systems, you might be pleased to note we're not using any formally apart from a few simple additions. Firstly, let's have a look at the development. <coughs> it's, as I said, it's an intercity development, inner city development, and it presented a challenging commission. The proposal consisted of three blocks. You can see there, <coughs> there and there. They were rising out of a um, common ground floor area which was a retail which also had retail um, with two car parking levels below the three blocks were very different each had a different number of levels they had, there was varying floor layouts there was different uh, floor areas there was various classes of accommodation and just to make it really interesting they put a hotel in one of them the architect's plans also indicated common facilities on the upper floors. Whoops. My. Sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, where was I? Yeah, common facilities on the upper floors. So suggesting the, fit, the, the lifts will be subject to some heavy mixed traffic. Although not tall, the buildings created patterns of access and circulation that, that became complex and difficult to estimate. So let's briefly look at the... Uh, various traffic conditions. I know many of you will know this off by heart, but not so widely accepted as being representative. But this old graph from George Strakosch clearly demonstrates the expected traffic conditions. So apart from being idle, there's four basic conditions. So following the graph from left to right, at the beginning we, of the work period, we have an up peak, which we can see there. Demand is heavy, cars will be over 50%. <coughs> and the whole period lasts about 30 to 60 minutes. It's characterised by a gradual build-up of passengers to a maximum demand with a sharp decline. This leads to a period of light random or balanced interfloor traffic and that's found generally between the peak periods. And in this instance here, we can see it mid-morning and afternoon. There's no real dominant direction of travel. Demand is light. Several cars may be parked and unused and it plays little demand on the control systems. This is followed by the lunch or the mixed, mixed peak. There's no real dominant direction of travel, but demand is heavy. Cars are over 50%. Traffic flows in both directions to all floors. And unlike the other peaks, this may last for several hours with a number of sub-peaks in, in either direction. This proved to be the hardest condition to predict and to accommodate. Then we move to some more light balanced traffic and then on to the period of down peak at the end of the work period. The dominant direction, of course, is down. Demand is heavy. And unlike the up peak, it lasts a little longer. So it's a brief overview of the peaks, uh, the, um, the traffic conditions. Now, the control, condition, uh, control systems we had to look at. And there is a multitude of control systems in the marketplace. Some from major lift manufacturers, others from independent uh, controller manufacturers. Each come with a claim, each come with its adherence and its critics. 
Several variants were offered and we, re and we reviewed them, but we'll just keep to the basics here. Firstly is conventional group control system, next car available, which I will refer as NCA. It's the most modest of the three. Three cars are dispatched, sorry three, lift cars are dispatched to the nearest hall call in the direction they are travelling, as long as there is capacity. Passengers single signal which direction they wish to travel in with a two, two button hall call station. Estimated time of arrival, or ETA. ETA is similar to the NCA and to most passengers it appears identical, except the hall calls are prioritised regarding the time the hall call has been registered. The supervisory group controller is constantly monitoring all the hall calls and the, and the car positions and seeking the lowest estimated time of arrival of each car. Then we had a look at the uh, hall call allocation, or HCA. This is a more sophisticated system and I know it goes by several other names but we will keep to HCA today. And the group dispatcher receives the passenger's intended direct destination in the lobby. Whoops, I didn't touch anything then. And the dispatcher directs the passengers to the most appropriate lift car. Well, that's the background. Let's have a look at the investigation and I am pressing it this time. Well, it was simulation that highlighted the differences between the control systems. There's a question we asked ourselves, can the mathematics? And we had a look at this. Whilst consistent, reliable and sophisticated, manual, basic manual calculations are, are simplistic and they're not as flexible as the world of moving people. Standard calculations are based on a set of ideal conditions. They use a rectangular probability distribution. Passengers arrive at a uniform rate. They travel up from the main floor. Four pop populations tend to be <coughs> proportional floor heights uniform. Simulation on the other hand with its Poisson probability distribution lends itself to more complex situations like interfloor traffic, differing floor populations, inconsistent floor heights, irregular passenger arrival and multiple access and egress. Although the mathematics can be extended to account for some uh, of these complex situations it can't handle them all. These conditions are best assessed by software-driven iteration of general analysis or simulation. So the next task was to compare the operation and the performance of the control systems. And we searched for a, a way of doing this. We needed a simple and repeatable method that could review all... Hey? Who's got a button? Yeah. So I was searching, that's it, back to searching. And I found an explanation uh, by Dr. Richard Peters. Surprise, surprise. It was regarding the call call degradation process. And we found this a way of providing a means of comparing the systems. I think you might recognize this, Richard. So with a little mod modification, we created this traffic profile. And for this exercise, we assumed a simple algorithm. It was just a reduced time to destination. So considering an 11th floor building, 0 to 10, with a four crowd group, as in this chart, two hall calls are being placed. A on the left, there he is, and there's E on the right hand side. A's at level 6 and wants to go to 2, E's on the right and wants to go to 0. The four cars are in motion, car 1 is on 10 and going down to 8, car 2 level 9 and go into 5. Car 3 is filling up with 6 delegates on the 8th and is heading for level 1. And car 4 is on level 4 with D going to 10. Now I can press it. Oh. Now, as we all experience, our journeys are not isolated. Passengers affect each other. And the effects of passengers' journeys, this is known as the system degradation factor. And for clarity, and from so that's my own simplistic views. Um, I, you know, I identify two factors, SDF1 for picking up other passengers and SDF2 for dropping off other passengers. The HCA calculation includes all these time components. Each possible journey is analysed and expressed as a total time cost. And this is equal to the estimated time of arrival, the transit time and the SDFs. And that is expressed in seconds. So for example, if car three over there was to pick up A, we have an ETA 
of 10 seconds. It's the transit time of 20 seconds. But six passengers will be inconvenienced when A enters the car, so we apply a 10, 10 second penalty for each occurrence. Likewise, A will be inconvenienced by the six delegates when he leaves, so we apply another six second penalty. So the total time cost is 150 seconds. The same assessment is made of all the cars and all the passenger combinations, and the total time cost for each permutation is noted at the bottom of the chart. And you can read that in the paper. So, so here are the permutations of the total time cost of answering all the calls. Car 4 is disregarded as it's travelling in the wrong direction. But with the lowest total time cost of 50 seconds, car 1 is dispatched to A. With car 1 now committed and on its way, and with the next total time cost of 55 seconds, car 2 <coughs> is dispatched to collect E. Now we have to apply the same rules to the other systems. But the NCA and the ETA do not assess the effect of time on their algorithms, but the process of answering the calls does consume time. The ETA dispatcher accounts for the estimated time of arrival, so we need to add the transit time and the SDF to its figures. The NCA makes no account of time, so we need to apply all three time components to the process. And this is what we get. So from this table we can see pick up A with the lowest total time, lowest arrival time over there, the ETA will select car 3, but it's got a total time cost of 150 seconds. The nearest car above, the NCA will also collect, select car 3, but that's got a 150 second time cost. With the lowest total time cost of 50 seconds, the HCA will select one. And you can see the same thing happens with picking up E. The HCA is, in both instances, it performs extremely well and it's beneficial to its passengers. Although it's simplistic, it clearly de demonstrates the efficacy of the HCA system. So we return to the original question, why doesn't the HCA surpass the other systems in all conditions? Maybe we need to review the systems in another way. Oh, and at this point, it's an apology. There's a typo in my paper. It refers to TTC as SDF at this point. I understand the PDF will be uh, amended. So, returning to Richard's original um, example, we re reviewed step profiles. <coughs> a step profile simulation provides another way of viewing a control system's performance. The step profile increments the number of passengers at set intervals, thus increasing the demand on the system. And in this instance, the number of persons is increased every five minutes until the system becomes saturated. I believe it was 1% every five minutes. Initially, we set Elevate to assess a lunchtime peak of 45% up, 45% down, and 10% into floor, as described in the BCO. Then we tried it at 40%, 40%, 20 to accommodate the client's brief. And whilst many outputs and results were available from Elevate, we chose queue lengths and waiting times, as these were requirements from the BCO and the client. And, the client. and here we have the results of one of the sets of profiles, uh, step profile simulations. In each case, the queues lengthened with time. And the, increase in, and the increase in arrival rate, sorry. The NCA saturated around 52 minutes, the ETA 55 minutes, and the HCA 38 minutes. You can see the saturation points around there. Probably more clearly seen in the paper than they are on the screen. But to check the trend further, we run more step profiles, and that was including a large, larger up peak of 70% with a 20% down, 10% into floor, and more balanced traffic of 35, 35, 30. The results of all these profiles clearly indicated all three control systems saturated sooner with the increase of interfloor traffic. However, in each case, the ETA held out a little longer. It's not a large margin. The small is quite different. different. The difference is small, sorry. Mouse going to dry. 
And like the original investigation, these results felt counterintuitive, especially considering the claims of some of the more vocal advocates of hall call allocation. So, to conclude and to summarise then. Well, firstly, a word about the analysis. Despite the claims of some, the analytical mathematics work and they're still relevant. Simulations fine-tuned the results and in this instance highlighted a variation between the control supervisory algorithms, a nuance overlooked by the mathematics. Manual calculation is by no means redundant. It provides the VT specifier with a glimpse of the quality of service and the analytical method also remains a good tool for projects with simple profiles, clearly defined peaks and demanding interfloor traffic and single floor access. Now to have a look at the control systems then. The next car available only reacts to calls that's placed on the system. It follows a very, very simple set of rules. The ETA is a little more intelligent and it responds to differing lobby conditions as it monitors the, the hall call, the length hall calls have been placed. Excuse me. Calls are transferred between the cars. The HCA is programmed to the initial information provided by arriving passengers. It considers all permutations before allocating a lift car to a passenger. It makes better use of the cars by grouping them together. It reduces journey times. It reduces the possibility of duplicate journeys and cars following each other. On face value, the HCA seems to have all the advantages. The HCA control system outperforms the traditional NCA and ETA systems in peak conditions. However, it seems to struggle with two-way heavy, heavy two-way interfloor traffic as there's fewer opportunities to effectively group passengers together. A well-designed HCA will provide improvements over the NCA and ETA. However, when the demand changes, it appears the ETA will provide a small advantage over the HCA due to its ability to constantly reevaluate the change in demand. The HCA is unable to reevaluate. Its decision is based on the information provided by arriving passengers. It announces intention. The lift car is committed. It's final. It's irreversible. So the answer to the investigation appears to be, and simply put, it's all due to the ETA's ability to adapt to change. So what did we learn from this? The results are subtle. So being aware of the differences is really essential. The designer must be aware of the benefits and the shortfalls. And with current reliance on new technology, the designer must vigorously test all the expected scenarios and solutions. This research has taken many paths and raised a few questions, and I hope to initiate some discussion over the way we view and consider some of the solutions. And it appears to have come from other, the other um, presentations. So what next? Hybrid systems, as described by Len last year? Or do we see an extension of the Internet of Things, as described by Lutfi? Maybe Apple, Google or Microsoft will develop applications that interface with the HCA controller. Re-evaluation and car changes could then be instantly brought to the attention of passengers via a smartphone, a watch, earbud or a necklace. Some cars, buses and trains are already connected, so why not traffic lights, coffee machines or lifts? This stage of my journey is finally reaching a conclusion. I have been advised that my application has been referred to the UK Engineering Council and I await their decision. And I'd recommend this, this alternative route for professional development. It's challenging, it has its rewards, and I'm happy to help, not discuss or assist. Thank you.